Good morning. Welcome to Bright Blue in partnership with HP Inc UK. This is the final event in our Past the Pandemic series. I'm Sarah Sands, the chair of Bright Blue, which is a liberal conservative think tank looking at domestic, economic and environmental policy. In short, our aim is to look at ways of improving society. There was a time when the economy was seen as antithetical to the environment, so the reconciling of the two would be a giant leap for society. The saying attributed to Winston Churchill about not letting a crisis go to waste has never been truer. As the pandemic recedes, the greater crisis of climate looms. We have G7 and COP this year to show what global Britain stands for. The thinking has to be now. Bright Blue has recently been producing analytical reports on electrical vehicles, essays on delivering net zero by industry type, and a policy manifesto aimed at tackling biodiversity decline. Bill Gates' new book, How to Avoid a Climate Disaster, offers a perfect template for a bright blue policy report, evidence-based, full of solutions. And we're gonna try for something similar today with our distinguished panel of climate policy experts. They all have last minute advice to the Chancellor on this day of the budget, and we shall see if he takes it. I shall introduce them. They will speak for five minutes each on their perspective and priorities for the green recovery. I'll get the discussion going and put your questions. So if you could ask the panelists questions via Slido and the code is hashtag past the pandemic. So we start with Dr. John Merton, who is the UK government's COP26 envoy. John was ambassador to the Democratic Republic of Congo. He's also been deputy high commissioner in Nairobi and the UK's permanent representative to the UN in Kenya. John. Thank you very much. Um, so I'm going to speak narrowly because COP26 is about more than I will speak about now, uh, but I'm happy to take questions on, on wider aspects of COP26. Um, first of all, can the market-based economy deliver green growth? Uh, I think the evidence of the last 30 years is absolutely that it can. And even if you look to the UK, over the period 1990 to 2018, we were the fastest growing member of the G7 Club of Industrialized Nations, and yet we reduced our emissions by more than other, any other member of that club by almost 45%. Uh, and I don't need to tell this audience that markets are a valuable system for, for developing your economy. Equally, mainstream economics understand that markets aren't perfect, and this has long been recognized through things like the monopolies and mergers commission. So we need to sort of control uh, and regulate markets for them to function well. Uh, and a common theme of that is the need to internalize externalities, whether that's making sure that a farmer pays for polluting a, a salmon river or uh, making sure that a, a coal fired power station is, is responsible for the, the impact of the sulfur dioxide that it, it pours out in the, in the 1970s and 80s that led to acid rain uh, in, in the US and in, in Sweden. Um, and Nick Stern in 2006 argued that climate change was the world's uh, biggest ever market failure. Uh, and what we've shown since 2006 is that if you can put a price in some way, shape or form on carbon or on some of its proxies, we can harness the same market forces to deliver green growth that we used to uh, tackle acid rain in the 80s um, and to deal with other environmental problems. And we've got a long history. If you go back to the 70s and 80s, you see um, sulfur dioxide emissions trading in California very successfully controlling the problem uh, of sulfur dioxide emissions. And we can apply the same you know, with respect to global warming. And technological development increasingly means that the old trade-off between economic growth and greening your economy no longer applies. In fact, I'd argue it's increasingly the reverse, that we will grow our economies by greening them. Um, now, COP26 will play an important part of that. And one of the things that we need to do at COP26 is to catalyze green growth globally. Uh, and um, a lot of green growth is beginning to happen anyway. We're seeing convergence of technologies. We've seen solar power come down in cost by 85% over the last decade. Battery technology, similarly. We're seeing zero emission vehicles now beginning to rival um, internal combustion engine vehicles. So change is naturally happening. 90% of uh, energy capacity additions globally last year were from wind and solar. And in Australia, that figure was nearly 99%. And in the USA, even under the Trump administration, coal use fell faster than it had previously under the Obama administration because market forces are moving in that direction. But we need to accelerate those trends, otherwise we'll fail to deliver the goals of the Paris Agreement that we all signed up to uh, in France back in 2015. And one of the themes of COP26 is how do we collaborate together to accelerate that transition? Uh, and I'll pick three themes that we're working on amongst others uh, ahead of COP26. 
uh, energy transitions to renewable energy, zero emission vehicles and finance. The experience of offshore wind has shown that just three or four countries working together and, and encouraging a market for offshore wind can bring down the price globally, but then the rest of the world can benefit from, and we've shown that in the North Sea. Um, and now we need to work together with other countries to uh, improve how we integrate increasing shares of renewables into our energy grids. If you look at zero emission vehicles, if you put the UK, the EU, China and California in a room, you can set global vehicle standards because you're setting the vehicle standards for more than 50% of global vehicle sales. Uh, and aggressive policies there can, can drive uh, change in the commercial sector and we're seeing that. And if you look at finance, if we can get every chief financial officer or every finance minister on budget day uh, to consider the climax, climate impact of every decision they take and the impact of climate change upon their business or upon their economy, we can speed up the transition to a low carbon economy. So measures like Chancellor Rishi Sunak announced last year that um, uh, financial disclosure along the lines of TCFD will be mandatory for all UK listed firms from 2023 will speed up the financial decision makers taking account of climate change and help them to factor in the risks of things like stranded assets uh, and shift investment away from brown uh, economic activities like coal and towards the new higher growth areas of the low carbon economy. Um, and, and we can speed the change, the, the rate of change at which it becomes economic for a society as whole to take a decision to say invest in renewable energy uh, or zero emission vehicles to the moment when it becomes uh, economically logical for individual consumers to make that decision and then the process becomes self-propelling. Um, and this creates huge economic opportunities uh, and if you look at the UK government's green zero, uh, growth commitments, uh, the fact that we're leading with a, with a net zero commitment and we were the first country in the world to make that commitment, the fact that we've set stretch targets like the 2030 uh, phase out date for internal combustion engines enables us to link ourselves to huge economic opportunity and just in the last month we've seen major vehicle manufacturers like General Motors, like Ford and Volvo announce that they'll be phasing out uh, the production of internal combustion engines. And the fact that the UK is taking stretch targets in these areas means that we're going to be a prime location um, for investment in those areas. Uh, and as technology come, converges in the same way as it has done with mobile phones, where you've seen the convergence of the internet and telephony, uh, we will see new economic horizons open up. Uh, for example, if you look at zero emission vehicles, as you sort of consider the convergence of zero emission vehicles with automated driving technology, you'll see new services and opportunities ar arise and you'll see things like transport as a service being offered uh, and people having fractional ownership of vehicles or, or sort of uh, essentially you see Uberless, uh, driverless Uber taxis, you see huge economic opportunities. And if we're at the forefront of that wave by having committed to, to ambitious targets ourselves, that can only be good for the UK economy. I think that's my five minutes, but I'm very happy to take uh, questions on that afterwards. Thanks so much. We'll go through it. Can I just pick you up on, on one thing? It, it, one is that the markets, you know, tend to be competitive. You're asking them also to be collaborative in this way, aren't you? So to, uh, which, which is an in, interesting um, new sort of mindset. But if I could ask you just what, particularly about dates, that um, it, in the Bill Gates book, he says, you know, net zero 250, he, he thinks is doable that um, decarbonizing by 2.30 sort of isn't because people will start to take sort of shortcuts, it'll become piecemeal, we'll do the easy stuff rather than the hard stuff in order to make the targets. What, what's your thought on the 2.30 date? Well, one of the things we've, we've seen through our experiences, you can have incremental short-term targets and they are helpful, hmm. but they do risk taking you down a technological cul-de-sac. So, for example, if your target is to commit uh, reduce emissions by 30% by 2030 from today, for example, you might switch from coal to gas, and that's useful for reducing emissions. But that will only take you so far, and you risk creating stranded assets in your, your gas power stations, for example. Whereas if you have a combination of long-term targets, like a net zero dated target, as we have in the UK and, and now in the EU and the US will be adopting, and you combine that then with short term targets that ensures that you're not just backloading all your effort to 2050 or what have you and, and saying we'll do nothing until 2048. Uh, but equally, it means that decision makers now, if they're investing in infrastructure that will last 20, 30 years, uh, have to have that longer term target in mind uh, and they won't take necessarily short term decisions that could lead us down technological cul-de-sacs. So that combination of a net zero target and short term way markers, I think, is a very powerful one. Thank you. Um, and Natalie, uh, Baroness Natalie Bennett, the former leader of the Green Party. 
She's a former member of the board of the European Green Foundation and a member of the board of the European Green Journal. Your five minutes. Thanks very much, Sarah. And it's lovely to be with everyone on this budget morning. Um, and I'll pick up where you left off on the 2030. And you know, the fact is, the science is we have to go much faster than 2050. And there's a real problem, politically speaking, that 2050 is, I was calculating yesterday, you know, at least five governments away, although given our current rate of turnover, possibly considerably more, and probably five ministers, or prime ministers, or possibly considerably more. So we've got to move much faster. And what we've really we'd ideally be hearing from the uh, the Chancellor today, although I'm not expecting it, um, is um, we're not going back to business as usual. We're really turning around our systems. And you know, we've focused, um, John has a terribly important job in terms of COP26, but that's only one of our problems, the climate emergency. The Dasgupta review, uh, we've got the um, COP15 for biodiversity coming up. We've choked our oceans with plastics. Our current system is broken. And at the same time, we've also created a poverty rat uh, insecure society. Um, one of the things we're hearing is that finally some of the three million um, freelancers um, uh, are going to get some extra money. But we've actually seen, I mean, I've got an amendment today on the financial services bill um, about debt. Um, and that's really trying to help some of the people who over the last decade have not made enough money to meet their basic bills and about more and more debt. And now they're hit with COVID and you know, they've got unpayable debts. So what we've had is our market-driven economy managing for GDP growth, managing for the market. The market is king. We all have to serve the market. Really has profoundly failed and we need to change around. And I think when we're talking about the green recovery, there's a real risk that we're uh, prioritising big, shiny things. We talk a lot, I had a piece in The Ecologist yesterday talking about innovation. And if you say innovation, I've, I've been, was at an LSE round table and they were talking about innovation. It was all big, shiny things made out of metal. If we've been green, we're gonna do it through a circular economy. So that's the green bit. Um, and you know, we are not meeting people's basic needs. Um, the Green Homes Grant Scheme, the uh, Lord Callanan actually admitted to me, I had a little oral question on that this week, um, effectively admitted it's a total failure. That's how not to do things. Throw a chunk of money in a short-term scheme uh, without really thinking about how you're actually going to deliver it, without thinking about whether you've got the skills to do it. Home energy efficiency is an absolute basic. And we come here also to the, the problems with the levelling up agenda. Um, levelling up agenda suggests we make everything like London and the South East. Um, you know, that's profoundly unsustainable. What we actually need is a spreading out agenda with prosperous local economies in every community in the land. And if we think about that from a green perspective, the wonderful thing about home energy efficiency measures is we need them um, in every community in the land. There's opportunities for tens of thousands of small business, huge numbers of jobs. And someone I was at another meeting I was at lately, I've been a lot of these recently, was saying, oh, but won't those jobs run out when we, once we've insulated every home that needs it? Well, yes, in about 40 years time. But quite frankly, I think we can leave that to some other chancellor or some other generation to worry about. 40 years of good, uh, stable jobs in every community up and down the land, insulating homes, ensuring that we cut our excess winter deaths, cut our pressure on our NHS, make sure we're warm and comfortable. What conceivably could be wrong with that? And the other thing is, I think you, I declare I've got my first degree is agricultural science, so I'm, I'm more interested in the biology. Um, and you, we talk, the government talks the talk about nature-based solutions, and we've got the environmental land management schemes coming through. Um, but we have to entirely transform the way we manage our land. And again, this ties in with social imperatives because food security is a huge and pressing problem uh, arising for our communities. So what we need to be thinking about is how do we actually um, you know, create, again, market gardens supplying vastly more fruit and vegetables, which is what our health needs. Market gardens around every town and city. Um, again, huge numbers of small, uh, small businesses, job opportunities, cooperatives uh, in every community in the land. So when we're thinking about a green recovery, you know, let's we we need some of the big green shiny stuff. Yes, we we need wind turbines, we need solar panels. We should be seeing solar panels on everyone's roof. We need to be seeing electric cars, although far fewer electric cars than we have petrol and diesel driven cars. You know, as John was saying, we need to see you know a car club based kind of model, um, and that frees up lots of space in our cities. I've been in Ghent. Um, in the city where they've essentially got rid of cars from the centre and lots of what now car, were car, spark, car parking spaces um, are now children's playgrounds. 
wouldn't that be nice in our cities? So what we really need to do is look at a different model of society. Uh, I'm not expecting the Chancellor to deliver that today. What I'd love him to say, although I'm not expecting it, is um, in New Zealand, they're managing their treasury, main part of their treasury website, uh, has how we make decisions, which is the living standards framework. And that is a kind of sustainable development goals model that looks at the economy, society, and the environment and says, how do we manage all of these to optimum levels? So let's stop talking about GDP, let's stop chasing growth, and let's talk about delivering a decent, healthy society. That's what greenness means to me. Thanks very much. Uh, that's great, and thank you. And I noticed um, actually in, in, in the, again, the Bill Gates book, I think he said that the big disappointment had been that you saw what happened when um, uh, when planes weren't flying, when we weren't moving, and so on. That actually, it didn't make that much difference. It only, the emissions only were down by about sort of five percent. So all the idea that if we just adapted the way we lived, it would make a difference, you know, seemed not not to be so. But but you you still think that there's a big sort of behavioural change, and that that the pandemic was a kind of social census, do you? That where we can where we can start to come up with a um, new ways of more community-based, um, a more community-based economy? Very much so. And I, and I think one of the other things that's really important from COVID-19 is we're used as Greens to being told, oh, you just want things to change too fast. The world isn't like that with a patronising pat on the head. What we found with COVID-19 was the world turned around in a couple of weeks. Uh, you know, we went from 5% of people working from home to 50% of people working from home virtually overnight. Um, that was because we had a medical emergency we have a climate emergency, a nature crisis, we have a crisis of poverty and inequality. Our society is profoundly broken. Um, let's look at that emergency in the same kind of way as we did with COVID and you know, operate at almost the same kind of speed. Thank you very much. And uh, next we're going to uh, Lord uh, Deben, who's chair of the um, Committee on Climate Change, former Conservative Party chairman, and in the days he was playing John Gummer, Environment Secretary. Your well, thank you very much. Um, first of all, I want to say that there is a great difficulty that all of us who are trying to move this agenda forward have. On the one hand, um, we have an absolute commitment to urgency. We are very short of time to win this battle against climate change. On the other hand, if we depress people to such a degree that they really feel we may as well eat, drink and be merry because tomorrow we die, then we won't actually achieve our ends. So I want in my few moments just to, <clears throat> to remind us that we have those two things which are very clearly um, uh, 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 pressures. Uh, and I therefore want to talk to, about urgency first. I mean, urgency is really what's wrong at the moment. I mean, this government has had all the great uh, um, uh, determination. It's got its 10 points. It's uh, saying that it wants to achieve this and that and the other. But actually, in the last four months, there's very little you can point to as to actually having been done. Now, I'm a doer. I want to deliver. And I think the issue is delivery. Now, I don't agree with Natalie. I don't think our uh, society is broken in that sort of way. I think our society has got to make fundamental changes. But actually, we have delivered to vast numbers of people standards of living, decency, which they've never had before. If I look at my little village, when I think of the conditions in which most people lived, 50, 100 years ago, and compare that with what they now live in, I'm not prepared to say the society is broken. I'm, all I'm saying is that we've gone down a route, if I use John Merton's comment, down a cul-de-sac, because it actually goes on and down that way, and we'll have a broken world. I do think we have a broken planet, and that's what we have to put right. The Pope has actually summed it up better than anyone else, which is to say, that um, climate change is the symptom of what we've done to the world. And what we have to do is to deal with the disease. And the disease is, and Natalie is right about this, the disease is very much 
not just a question of what our emissions are. It's a question of how we look after our soil. It's a question of how we care for other people. It's a question of how we really think about um, the pollution that we create, um, which isn't causing climate change, but is merely merely destroying the lives of people because of the uh, uh, because of their health. We have to think about the biodiversity that we are losing at a record rate. Above all, we have to think about the world in which we hand on to our next generation. We have received a much more fulfilled world in the natural sense than we're going to pass on. That is the fact. When I was young, which is a long time ago, um, the fields were filled with flowers in a way which they aren't today. Uh, when I was young, the air was cleaner in a way that it is not today. When I was young, the soil was significantly more fertile than it is today. When I was young, the birds sang much more widely than they do today. Rachel Carson's The Silent Spring is what brought me to environmentalism. And I have to say, what she said was true, and we have done it. So let's recognize the urgency of putting this right, because it is a disease which will kill us if we do not do what we need to do. And my concern, and this is really the vital center of what we're doing in the Climate Change Committee, my concern is that the government has to move a great deal faster. The second thing is it has to move much more across a much bigger field. How on earth do we have a planning system which means that the Cumbrian County Council can make a decision on a coal mine without having the resources to know what that means in the terms of our carbon um, uh, programme and the law that we have to deliver net zero by 2050? How can you tell people that they've got a planning permission till 20? Uh, 47, when actually you won't be able to use that coal without carbon capture and storage after 2036. I think that's dishonest, leave alone anything else. But the planning system, has, how do we have an education secretary who has not made a statement of any kind about the necessary um, work that has to be done universally to train people in this country for the new green revolution? Why is it that we uh, are able to produce a scheme which is essentially necessary to make our homes um, much more uh, energy efficient, which works as far as the work through the local authorities is concerned? Great success. Don't let's kid ourselves. This government done very well in that area. And secondly, it's doing very well as far as social housing is concerned. But it's totally failed to have a system which people actually want to buy in for, if you like, the average run of people to change their homes so that they use less energy and that they are able to live still comfortably and warm. Wholly against those who think we'd be better off colder, better off not having the, um, uh, the, the, the facilities that we, we have. I, I, I think that puritanical element in Greenpeace is a thing that really annoys me constantly and puts people off. So the question is urgency doing this right across the board and not leaving it all to Bayes and DEFRA. And the last thing it is, is actually giving people the understanding that we can achieve this. So I end up with the first of the second of those things. If you, if you tell people this is an impossibility, then you're not going to win. What you've got to tell people is that it is a possibility if you really pull together to do it. And if you recognize that the cost which is less than 1% of our GNP, and I agree about GNP being a bad measure, but as it's the one other people use, you have to show what it means in that context, less than 1% of the GNP, largely paid for by the private sector. The big problem is that it won't be spread fairly across the economy. And that's why the Treasury is right to have taken up our proposal, which is to look at how you make a just trans uh, uh, transfer. You have to move in a just way. And I want to see from the Chancellor the beginnings of a proper program for ensuring that that is delivered. So let's, in bright blue, be really tough about it. 
this government has all the right instincts and determination. What it hasn't done is to deliver. It doesn't yet understand how urgent this is and how it isn't, there is no time to wait. It has to be done and it has to be done now. And if we're going to win in November in the in COP26, then we'll have to show by the time we get there, not what our intentions are, but what we've actually achieved. And there's only a few months to go. Thank you very much. And actually the Cumbrian uh, mine was a, a very interesting example of some of the sort of political confusion, wasn't it? That there was sense of sort of jobs now and also that it might seem um, you know, a bit fancy to be talking about, um, you know, sort of green, green policies when, uh, the, the, so there was a slight sort of sensitivity towards a, a sort of, red, you know, red wall mentality. Um, and I just wonder, you know, in that, that firstly, does the government lack a big joined up policy? Should it be talking about um, nuclear, for instance, and just sort of, you know, going for something. Um, and uh, I guess the other question is going back to your village about standards of living is that um, when you apply that to emerging countries as well, you know, that how do you, how do you sort of convince people that, um, you know, that they're, that, uh, that they're not going to be sort of kept down in the way that the rich Western countries have had all the, have a good, all the good time and now they have to do the payback. Well, we do have to do the payback because we have to pay for those for, for those countries to be able to jump the dirty period and yeah. reach the point in which they're properly, uh, they have the standards of living that uh, we would expect and which they have a, a, a right to. We've used pollution to become rich and we now have to pay the price of that. But it's us who pay the price of it, not those, which is why the government is morally bankrupt in one area. One thing which has been done, which is an outrage, which was to cut our contribution to developing countries from 0.7 to 0.5. When you're in a hole, you don't dig a hole for people who are worse off than yourself. And I do believe this was a really disgraceful decision. We are, although, in a different moral position when it comes for our help for people to change for climate change purposes, because we are the biggest donor and we are doing that effectively. And we have to say that that is that that is a, a plus point. It would be made much better if we hadn't made that very, very foolish decision and wrong. I mean, just simply morally wrong decision, which we we made um, without any discussion um, and which I think is very embarrassing to John. It's very embarrassing to any civil servant to have to defend what is an indefensible position. But uh, I, I mean, you the 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 issue for us is surely not that you have to have a great plan in the sense of all going for nuclear. I mean, I'm in favour of nuclear power. I think those those who don't accept it, well, I'm afraid, Natalie, you are wrong about this because the science, which you're always talking about, the science shows that we cannot get to net zero without having this as a, as a, as a certainly as a uh, an answer for a relatively short period of time. And really, if you want to get the support of the nation, and this is why the Green Party is very often seen to be out on one side. I love you because what you do is to press us to go further. But you really do have hang ups. You have hang ups about nuclear power, which we need for a short period of time and which if we don't have, we cannot deliver. And that's what the Climate Change Committee, I'd love not to have nuclear power. I've got no problems about that. But the Climate Change Committee has done the science on it. So really, you can't be selective on science because of political hang-ups. And you've got a political hang-up about nuclear, as you do about capitalism. And only capitalism will deliver this. We can't do it. So you always revert to, 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 the, you always revert to that Trotskyite view about the economy. And we can't do it that way. Let uh, we'll we'll uh, let Natalie uh, respond to that. But first, can I just let Tice have his sort of five minutes? Uh, uh, Tice Brook is uh, head of government relations at HP Inc in the UK, Ireland, and Northern Europe. Also, a councillor in the City of London, and serves on the boards of the Museum of London, the Barbican, and is chair of the City of London Academies Trust. Tice, your five minutes. Yeah, th thanks, uh, Sarah. Um, uh, first of all, to say it's great to partner with Blight Brew today. Um, and as it is budget day, I'll talk a little bit about money. Um, I think today our discussions this morning shows that there is real, the real moment, we, we need real momentum to act. 
Um, and the pandemic has caused a big shift in consumer behavior. Uh, a recent study by Eon, for example, revealed that a third of Brits are buying products from companies with strong environmental credentials. And more than half think environmental credentials of a product or a service are just as important as the price they pay for it. Governments too are looking at their purchasing power. At 292 billion pounds, public procurement in the UK accounts for around a third of all public expenditure. Indeed, money talks. We are seeing good progress on sustainable procurement in the UK. For example, the sustainable procurement duty in Scotland or the cabinet office social value model in England. But governments should go further. To build back, back, better, we must buy back greener. Don't make green criteria an option or an afterthought. Governments must put sustainability at the heart of their procurement decisions. To use Lord Deben's words, we can achieve this. Our commercial customers, for example, are already leading the way. If we look at printing, the paper used in HP products represents around 20% of our carbon footprint. And we are committed to bring this down. In 2016, we set a goal to eliminate deforestation from our paper. And three years later, in 2019, we, ma we maintained zero deforestation associated with HP branded paper. Together, we can help our customers print more responsibly by designing printers and software to optimize paper use or by improving the recyclability of paper. But current UK government procurement standards do not take the need to reduce the environmental impact of printers or indeed inked cartridges into account which means that remanufactured, cloned or illegal cartridges could be purchased by the public sector. And we know that clones have a larger environmental impact than original toner cartridges. 32% more energy usage, 43% more fossil fuels consumed and 45% larger carbon footprint. Compare that to the innovation and investment of companies such as HP to eliminate deforestation, recycle or develop green products and increase the reuse content in our cartridges or laptops. Which means that today almost 1 million ocean-bound plastic bottles a day are now being converted into inked cartridges at our HP recycling plants. Yet, for a government procurement manager, it is still too easy to buy less sustainable options. Remandating public procurement across government will not only foster a green recovery, but it also puts the UK on a surer route to net zero. We need to look at the full costs of our procurement decisions. This includes the social and environmental costs. The UK has now a unique opportunity to show global leadership on this important topic. While the EU encourages member states to draw up national action plans, few have robust and mandatory standards for sustainable procurement. By mandating green procurement criteria, not just looking at the environmental, um, environmental practices of suppliers, but also at the products the public sector is purchasing, ahead of COP26, the UK would show true international leadership on net zero. And if you not take it from me, take it from Bill Gates, who, um, as you mentioned in his recent book, called for governments to use their procurement power to drive demand for low and zero carbon pr products saying that major commitments to buy green will send a clear signal to the market that there is demand for these products. Indeed, we need to make sure environmental credits of the products or services we buy as a nation become as important, if not more, as the price we pay for it. As Bill knows, money talks. To build back better, we must buy back greener. Thank you. Thank you very much. And I'm going to uh, uh, take that to um, a, a John Merton because it's an interesting point about procurement and I don't know if we'll see it in the budget. We know they're going to be talking about sort of construction and infrastructure. You know, you could say, um, uh, can we have um, then a criteria on the steel used and the cement and so on? Is, there, is, the, is the government not being sort of smart enough about, about procurement? procurement and I know in, in the Bill Gates um, uh, passage that you mentioned you know he points out that the effect that it had on the internet actually of knowing that governments were going to buy this stuff so it affects R&D and so on. Do you think that the government's been a bit slow on this? Um, I think it, it's moving quite 
a lot if you look at my home department uh every, every department is taking uh steps if you look at my home department in the foreign commonwealth and development office all of our ambassadors overseas now uh, are taking delivery of, of electric cars as we shift uh to electric cars in in what we do overseas um but i mean i think it, it's an emerging trend. If you look at uh, the Prime Minister's latest announcement on offshore wind, and, and you know, as an example of technological development, he's gone from in 2013 arguing that the wind, offshore wind couldn't blow the skin off a, white, a rice pudding to arguing that in 2020, you know, we set a target for 2030 that, that the UK become the Saudi Arabia of wind and we power every home in the UK by, by offshore wind. Um, if you look at offshore wind, we've successfully helped develop the offshore wind industry through the work that we've done over the, the the last decade or more in the North Sea, but I think there's a, an exception that probably there's more we could have done uh, to to develop uh, the associated industries that will bring wealth uh, within the UK in, in uh, uh, associated with that. And and now increasingly, as we look forward, you're seeing the sort of plans for industrial clusters in the northeast of England, and 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 that sort of more integrated thinking about how we transition to a low carbon economy, making use of the jobs and skills that are already there example in the offshore oil and gas industry and and retraining people and repurposing uh you know uh skills so that they can be then used in things like offshore wind so i think that th that thinking is, is is emerging and now that we have a net zero target it provides that really strong framework for thinking well if we are going to be at net zero in 2050 <coughs> um then we that that includes everyone that that's the beauty of a net zero target. If you if you said we're going to make sixty percent reduction or eighty percent reduction, everyone thinks they're in the forty or the twenty yeah, percent. Exactly. Whereas when you say net zero, everyone knows they're in, and they all have to plan for it. And every business leader, uh, every council leader, has to start thinking like that. And that's why, uh, you know, that's why it's such a useful target, and it will help us plan ahead and say, well, if this industry is going to is going to sort of uh, sort of be passing away as we move to a low carbon economy what do we need to do to enable the people in those industries to have the skills to to work in the new sectors that will be growing and just to pick up on a point natalie said i mean i think one of the things that's that's really clear and it ties in with what ty said as well is that the, the low carbon economy will create a lot of jobs um the prime minister saying we won't be lagging in lagging in the uk it's very clear that you can actually create a lot of jobs uh, in energy insulation. If you put money, a million dollars into, a million pounds into renewable energy, you'll create more jobs than if you put a, a million pounds into fossil fuel development. And one of the beauties of a lot of the renewable energy technology that we're seeing is it's hugely scalable. So my background is in, uh, most of my career has been spent working in Africa. And one of the great things about this technology is that it's scalable down to a rooftop level. Uh, and actually, um, as, as, as Lord Devon mentioned, you can enable communities uh, in, in, the, in the poorest areas of the world to leapfrog to a low carbon economy in the same way as communities leapfrog from having no telephone at all to having a mobile telephone. So we will help communities who have no access to power, they're not connected to a power grid, um, leapfrog to having sort of rooftop solar, for example, and access to power that is, is clean and low carbon and scalable to where they are. Thank you. And um, Natalie, it'd be interesting to, to hear you, particularly on things like sort of plastics and so on, whether the whether the um, government should be doing more. And I must let you respond to um, Lord Devon as well on that your your um, your your political um, refusal to accept that uh, that, that nuclear is, has to be part of the energy answer. OK, well, I'm going to start on a positive with what John was just saying about um, jobs. And there's a really interesting Friends of the Earth uh, report out this morning looking at, at green youth jobs in particular, which I'd, I'd point people would be worth looking at. Um, and picking up on uh, uh, Lord Deben's uh, claim that I'm a, I'm a Trotskyite, and um, I'm often accused no, no, of being a, so a socialist. I, I don't get Trotskyite very often. No, um, I, and, don't, I didn't claim that. I said you revert to a kind of Trotskyism, which is a different oh, okay. OK, I'm accused of a kind of Trotskyism. Yeah. Well, you know, what, what I would say is that, you know, I don't think for the 21st century political philosophies that were born in, in the 19th century or earlier have the answers. And, you know, I would say that Green's a complete, complete political philosophy. And where I'll agree with Lord Deben is in terms of the, you know, I was talking about ecological innovation, the desperate need for re restoration of nature. Um, 
But we're, I also, we also need to talk a lot about social innovation. And just yesterday, uh, the London Assembly made London the biggest city in the world to call for a universal basic income. Now, that's a kind of foundational green political philosophy um, that helps people to live their lives in a different kind of way with security, which is what everyone's looking for. And if you're secure, you don't have to go chasing off after the same amount of stuff, the same hunt for security that drives so much consumption these days. But specifically on the nuclear point, I wrote down something that Lord Deven said. We just need nuclear for a short period of time. Now, we can have many arguments about nuclear, and boy, have I had many arguments over the years. But now, so far as I'm concerned, you, there is a simple killer argument against new nuclear, which it is way, way too slow. The fastest that you can deliver any new nuclear on the most, you know, absolutely everything going right, which we know it never does, um, is, is 10 years. Whereas you can put solar panels on your roof, um, you know, next week you can put wind turbines up um, within the next few months um, and renewables have the answer. And in terms of the models that the, um, the Committee on Climate Change puts forward, they're essentially assuming society continuing much as it is with the added technology. We're assuming transformation in the way societies live with things like a universal basic income, with things like far vastly more local food growing, with changes in diet. So we're looking at a different model of society rather than the existing model with added technology. And can I just you see, question you on this? Because the truth is, you've always been opposed to nuclear power. Um, I would like not to have to have nuclear power. All the work that we've done technically, all the science that we have led leads the Climate Change Committee with all those scientists. There's no, I mean, I'm the only person who could be called an ex-politician. The fact is, all those people have come to the conclusion that there is no way of getting to net zero without using nuclear power. Now, Natalie, my problem is this. It seems to me that your view of society um, impin impinges upon your ability to recognize what the science tells us. And the difficulty for that is I go around the country trying to get people, oh, now by Zoom, trying to get people to recognize that the science tells us that climate change is really happening, that it's really happening very quickly, and we've really got to do something about it. I don't think that it is helpful if in other bits of our lives we say, well, frankly, we're not going to take the best advice we can possibly have on that. We're going to say we don't like this particular means. And that seems to me to have been the huge problem in Germany, because the reason Germany is not moving as fast away from coal is simply because it made this theological decision not to have nuclear power. And so what I'm appealing to you about is that this is not an area for us to be putting our politics into it. This is an area in which we should be prepared to do all the things that are the best advice we can have and saying, well, if that's the best advice we can have, we'll go along with that because we've got to achieve this end. And the only thing that matters is delivering this end, which is the curing of the disease which has created climate change. And I might take that to, to John Merton. It's, do, do we have a choice in the solutions uh, to this, that we don't have to do nuclear? It, will, will, the, will the other um, energy solutions be enough or does nuclear have to be part of the solution? John Merton. Sorry, thank you. Yeah, um, I, I don't want to get drawn too deeply in. You'll appreciate I'm... Um, uh, Lord Devon may be the only ex-politician on the panel. I'm the only serving civil servant with all the constraints <laughs> that that gives me. But one of the things that is a feature of our, one of the things that is a feature of our policy and, and sort of speaks to the kind of market theme today is that uh, we have generally set the target in the UK and left the market to work out how to, to meet that, that target. And I think that's been a powerful approach in terms of reducing our emissions in a low cost way and enabling the technology to come up with things that we just wouldn't have considered possible and and, and Natalie referenced it in, re, in res, regard to for example zero emission vehicles um, we can sort of we can work on one assumption which is that zero emission vehicles will replace internal combustion engine vehicles one for one but there's a lot of evidence out there that there's going to be all sorts of technological convergences and just like mobile phones we now will you know if you live in London you can order your di dinner on Deliveroo through your mobile phone in the same way 
you know, there's been that convergence of internet and, and other technologies on a mobile phone. In the same way, we'll see convergence of technology with zero emission vehicles. And a lot of zero emission vehicles could become self-driving. And then if you live in a city, it's not, it's not an act of sacrifice. You might decide it's actually in your interest not to pay con you know, congestion charge and parking fees and all these things, but to actually rely on self-driving vehicles that you can use with ride hailing apps on your phone to, to summon your car. So there will be a lot of societal change as the technology allows it. And that's why we, you know, the approach that we generally have been taking is, is set the targets and then uh, leave a lot of the how they're met to the, to the market. And I think the same is true uh, in the energy sector. And there's, again, if you look at the, as we get zero emission vehicles, if we have millions of battery powered vehicles on the grid, they will also be uh, not just uh, drawing power from the grid as you need them for mobility, but they've got the potential to deliver power to the grid and even out some of these sort of, you know, um, uh, fluctuations in power supply that you get from, from renewable energy. So there's lots of opportunities out there uh, that we will see. And even in the way that markets behave, if you look at, um, you know, take, we take it now for granted with EasyJet that they will flex the price of the ticket in response to whether you're traveling on Friday night or, or Wednesday at three o'clock in the morning. Um, and we get used to that idea. Um, and, you know, there's, there are emerging models that you could look at in the energy sector that say, actually, rather than predicting demand and scheduling supply, as we move to a greater renewable grid, uh, we'll get to a position where we're actually predicting supply and then, you know, the market will schedule demand. So there are all these things that are sort of possibilities. And I wouldn't want to close, you know, them down by, um, by saying we have to do this or we have to do that. Okay, so you do you see that too that the that the that the, that the model um, economic model is going to change. We've seen that a bit actually already on trains, haven't we? Of you know that trains are going to run differently because people's working habits have changed. Do 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 you see that you know the jobs and and the economy is 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 going to change in a in a low carbon way? Uh, yes, I think I mean demands and 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 changing consumer behaviour, or indeed is the point I made, changing behaviour of government uh, purchasing. Um, will will drive that change, but I, I think um, and, and and given the urgency of this debate, I think um, the key question for government is how can we accelerate that? And 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 John is absolutely right. Um, Net Zero sets a really strong framework uh, and a target, and and shows that we're all in it. Um, but just leaving it to the market, and I I, I represent. Uh, uh, of course, a, a, a large uh, a global company probably wouldn't do it. So I would say if we want to accelerate it, we also need to stimulate um, that direction of travel. And if you take, for example, think about the low carbon economy, um, an area which is really fascinating is 3D printing and how that is linked to digital manufacturing. So rather than uh, having long, complicated supply chains where you have parts that are produced somewhere else in the world, you can actually onshore it, bring it back to Britain um, and uh, produce uh, materials uh, for, for manufacturing here. So you reduce waste, you shorten the supply chain, you reduce carbon emissions um, and you match supply and demand much quicker. And you can actually do that anywhere in the country. So you can use it to level up. Um, there are lots of small and medium sized businesses already using uh, 3D printing um, uh, facilities uh, like, like uh, HP produce uh, um, manufacturers. Um, also large car manufacturers are using it. Um, but um, we really need to that ecosystem to be stimulated. So you, you can really look at as government kind of where do we put um, tax breaks or investments in, in order to really stimulate demand. So I, I would say both um, the market can do it the technology is there, 3D printing a great example, um, and the government can push us all in the right direction. Well, that's Sarah, it. can I just raise, I mean, I do think we mustn't forget the whole issue of government procurement because it is a scandal um, that government procurement has not moved faster than this. Um, in my business life um, in Sancroft, we, we produce a, um, an annual report on the government's uh, on the government's um, contracting. And uh, we take the top 100, we do it with um, uh, a firm called Tussle, and we, together we take the top 100 um, contracts and look at them and see what is the um, record of those companies on modern slavery, just the issue of modern slavery. Now, last year, 38% of the major contractors to Britain 
uh, British government were breaking the law on modern slavery. Now, the law is the simplest, easiest. I, I mean, you know, you couldn't have a lighter touch law. And they were 38 percent, including one of the great four um, accountancy firms, um, including the uh, people producing much of Britain's technical technology. Now, if the government can't even make sure that everybody that it works with, every major company it works with, obeys the law, then you do have to ask a real question about our ability to control um, uh, our, uh, the, the uh, procurement of government. And indeed, what is very interesting is that the government doesn't really know uh, the extent of its own procurement. If it wants to find that out, it has to go outside government to ask private companies to tell them what across government is their procurement uh, picture. So again, I come back and see Natalie and I can, can tease each other about, about our po political issues. But the point is we're both on the same side in the sense that there are some very easy fundamental measurements, which are, if you can't even buy things yourself, on a proper basis. How can you expect me to make the choice, which I certainly have made, but choice to buy um, a, an air source uh, heat pump? Because I'm not doing it as a government. And it, it's that that really is the non-joined up bit. Let's uh, get uh, Natalie to, to answer that. And also perhaps that point about supply chains, which is someone I thought you, you might quite like the idea of manufacturing here rather than um, particularly post-Brexit, if there are a few hiccups on the supply chains, should we be thinking more about manufacturing here? Well, very much. And I'm very pleased to be able to agree with Lord Deben in terms of the um, issues of government procurement, which are disgraceful, but also picking up Tyson's point about um, manufacturing and things like 3D printing. I mean, this is where the market has totally failed. I mean, I uh, fairly recently had a fridge that failed and it was like seven years old and I went on social media to go, goodness sake, this is only a seven-year-old fridge. Um, and everyone went, oh, you were lucky it lasted that long. Um, we have things that have, the, you know, planned obsolescence has just slid down and down and down, shorter and shorter and shorter. Um, talking about the sort of changes we need to make that governments need to make is things like the right to repair, um, you know, the Manchester Declaration that says there should be, you know, companies shouldn't be allowed to sell things unless they're repairable, unless they supply parts, unless they supply you know, a handbook that tells you how to fix those parts. <laughs> All of those issues are the kind of social innovation um, that we need. Um, and just coming back to Lord Deben's point, and I'm not going to keep going on solar, but you, he said all of those scientists say that. The way people who are approaching science tend to look at society as it's this black box and this black box uses this much energy now, we need to feed this much energy in. And that's a scientific approach that doesn't say, but what about social change? And you know, I talked about universal basic income, but also what about a four day working week as standard with no loss of pay? Combine with that with the certainly vastly increased working from home that we're going to see in future. And your demand for transport energy starts to fall. You know, the case for HS2, which was, was never there, collapses even more so. Um, so we're looking at, at, at real change. And, you know, it's very difficult to model these things, just as like it would have been very difficult to model what would happen when the SARS-CoV-2 virus hit. Um, but we coped, we changed we flexed as a society, um, you know, who would have predicted that a uh, Tory government would be throwing huge amounts of money in furlough payments um, uh, before, the, before the, uh, the virus hit. So, you know, we need to change. The market hasn't delivered. The market has delivered us, you know, what a, you know, one of the most successful tech companies in the world, probably the most successful, you know, Apple, which explicitly has made its products to try and make sure that people buy a new one every year. How on earth can that be defensible? How can you have phone companies? Um, I saw adverts fairly recently, pre-COVID, but fairly recently, you know, from a mobile phone company saying, change your phone every year. How can that be considered a way forward for our society? It can't be. Uh, and uh, perhaps uh, uh, John Merton on, on uh, that simple point, but are we not seeing the change in terms of the way we're thinking. So um, HS2, are we looking at an old model of how we work and live? Should, should we be ditching that? Is that not fair to ask you? <laughs> John? I, I think I think that might be a little unfair to put, to put yeah, that one on. I, I, I'll, I'll come in in defense of the nice civil servant. Question. I'm going to ask you a nice <laughs> question that's come in from the audience. 
Uh, and this one, anyone can uh, start with. It's from Chris Ben Truman uh, from the Countryside Charity, uh, CPRE. We need more green space, market gardens, countryside near where people live. How can the government's proposed changes to the planning system deliver this? Is that, is that all right, John? <laughs> yeah. Can I just say one thing about that? The planning system is a crucial part. The government is going in the wrong direction with the planning system because it still believes in the idea that planning is somehow either a, um, a, a, um, a hurdle uh, to growth. And it, that's just totally untrue. There, there is no, there's no reason to believe that. So what we have to do is to have a planning system which actually encourages uh, the kind of green growth which we're talking about. And we need, if we're going to have that, one of the things we have to learn is people's health depends very much on the countryside and, and the, 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 the open air that is around them. And the Victorians understood that. That's why you have these wonderful parks. I mean, London, for example, and our great cities have wonderful parks because the Victorians understood that. And, and we really do have to turn the green belt. I think uh, Nikki Gavron's got a very good um, uh, view, which is that we should turn the green belt into something which is positive, not a restriction on growth, but an opening of the countryside round towns so that you give people that very necessary access um, and, and the health that comes from it. And our problem is that our accounting system is so bad because we can never account uh, for the cost to the National Health Service of not having this. We don't seem to have a mechanism for doing, for looking at that very carefully. So I'm entirely in favour of the CPRE's view of this. I think it's very important and we should be rebuilding on brownfield sites and not on greenfield sites. And we should be creating societies where people have easy access to the open air. And I say that as somebody who's very privileged because I'm sitting in the middle of a field practically, and that is a great joy. Anyone else want to pick up on, on land use and uh, planning permission? Well, I, I can say that I entirely 100% agree with everything Lord Deben said. <laughs> and um, one of the things, th things I'd add, and thanks very much for the question, is um, something that the, you know, the whole the science is moving very fast, innovation, our understanding of the human microbiome. There, there's a UN project called HUMI, the Healthy Urban uh, Microbiome Initiative. And we're increasingly knowing that, that basically having more greenery around you at whatever level actually makes people measurably physically healthier. Um, and that's not just physical health, it's also mental health. And it's not just because it looks nice. There's also impact on your, your microbiome, which impacts directly on your health. But I think um, where possibly I'm going to diverge from Lord Deben um, is you know, part, part of the question was, how do we get those market gardens around towns and cities? Well, we have the most concentrated land ownership um, in Europe. If you look at Scotland, for example, um, they've got a land reform movement. They've got some land reform measures. How can you see that if a community says, well, we need to want to put, you know, a belt of market gardens mm -hmm. around our town, how do we get that land at the moment? Um, the financial sector, the market, you know, makes that practically impossible. Uh, this is where if I was in the House of Lords, I would uh, look at the benches opposite me uh, and go land reform very loudly and watch the winces come. <laughs> Thank you very much. And I've got a question now for the, for the whole panel. Um, perhaps we'll start with um, Tice on this one from Catherine. How would you mitigate green skill shortages which could impede the transition to a green future? Are people not skilled um, in the right way for the, for the um, for the green recovery? Well, I think actually, and it touches on what Lord Deben said earlier about the importance of skills and education uh, in this space. Um, there were two different things. One is the continuous learning, so kind of the workforce of today um, and how we uh, equip them to, to take advantage of those new uh, uh, parts of the economy. And the other one is, of course, uh, my five-year-old son who is at homeschooling uh, downstairs um, is, is, is the new generation. So both probably require a slightly different approach. I think my son will be in a completely different space and his skills uh, and his, uh, um, he is he's doing coding for fun uh, uh, as we speak. Um, so, so that is a different situation. The, the current workforce and kind of uh, my generation uh, um, is, is another area where um, we should see technology um, as benefiting us and as we, if we understand and if we can engage with that 
and I've talked about 3D printing, then there are huge opportunities. If we, we don't do that as a, as a society, then, then we will lose out and, and actually the workforce of today will lose out. So I think it's important to do both the future generation and the current one. Uh, John Merton, the, the, the reskilling as part of the transition to the green recovery, is, is there more we should be doing? I think there's a there's a lot that will happen uh, in this regard. I mean, if you look, I'm speaking beyond my my brief as a civil servant, but sort of so if you look at geology departments across the universities in the UK, you know, geology is intimately linked to the fossil fuel industry. I, I don't think you'd have to be a sort of, you know, uh, a crystal ball gazer to imagine that, say, in, in the years to come, geology will sort of probably give way to sort of a lot of electrical engineering courses and so on as we learn how to integrate uh, a different sort of electricity supply into our grid. And if I come back to just that discussion about planning earlier, net zero is such a powerful concept and it's taking, you know, it inevitably will take a while to work through the machine, but it'll work through uh, to all layers of government over time, including planning. Um, and you just sort of have to see what that will mean in the future for sort of housing standards and so on, because if we don't, if, if we continue to build houses that aren't uh, aren't fuel efficient, then you're essentially you're creating a, a house that will essentially over time become more of a liability uh, than an you know a house that is built to high environmental standards. And it's a sort of it's a micro version of the argument we're, we're putting internationally ahead of COP26, which is to say, look, you know, look at the emerging trends in the in the world economy. Look at how coal is now being outcompeted by fossil fuels, um, and in just a few years' time, coal will be outcompeted by the you know, the marginal cost of operating an existing coal power plant will be uh, outcompeted by by new investments in in, in renewable energy. Um, I think you know that what we're encouraging people is don't you know don't create stranded assets. Don't build a coal fired power station that will risk becoming a stranded asset in 20, 30 years time. And just as that's true internationally, uh, it works true down to a, a local scale as well. Thank you. And, uh, and Natalie, the jobs of the future, are, are there enough jobs in the green economy to make up for the ones that we're going to lose in the old economy? Very much so, although I'd stress what I was saying about a four day working week as standard and we know we need to get to, to really take seriously the whole work life balance question. But in terms of um, you know, education and skills, um, I very much agree that we start with the basics and uh, Caroline Lucas, the Green MP, has really been big on we're getting a GCSE for nature. Um, and it, one of the key things about that is it actually involves being physically in nature, in contact with nature, and we need to see much more of that in our schools. Um, but we also, um, you know, there is a real social change that we need to see. I remember a few years ago, I was down in the southwest uh, meeting a young man who'd started up a great small business making stone walls. But he was actually talking to me very seriously because he, his, his father was very unhappy with this business, even though it was, he had this thriving business, because he was working with his hands out in you know the, the, the weather. Um, and he had a degree. And how could he have ended up that he had a degree and ended up doing this? And you know, we really need to look at we're actually seeing, particularly among young people, we're seeing lots of people who are keen to start growing businesses, seem keen to do these things. We need a shift in, in mindset. And I'll point to a great example of this, the Kindling Trust in Manchester, which trains people to set up small growing, food growing businesses. Um, and you know, it trains people both in, in the, the agronomy and in the economics of it. And that's the kind of model of sort of training schemes that we need that actually allow people to set up their small businesses. Coming back to around where I started saying we need a spreading out of the economy rather than leveling up. You, If we spread out and have strong local economies in every town and city where money goes round and round in a rich ecosystem of local businesses, at the foundation of that has to be a lot of ecology, biology, nature-based businesses. Um, and there's huge numbers of jobs there, but we, we have got a massive skill shortage to deliver them. Thank you. The last word, I guess, to you, um, uh, Lord Devon. And one thing I wonder is coming back to this sort of vision of the green recovery. And I, I don't know whether it's a sort of either or, but we've seen the sort of Greta Thunberg, you know, vision where you um, cut out a lot of the things we're doing, you know, traveling and so on, um, or that you solve it by technology. And, and, and do you have a sort of preference? Does it have to be either or, or, or do we need some totally new way of looking at the economy and the environment? Well, for me, it's it's usually both and and not either or. And I think in this case, it's both and too. I mean, we mustn't underestimate the enormous advantage which the generation um, which is now entering um, the world of business has had 
from being able to travel and to see the rest of the world. And so I really am not prepared to say that, uh, that there is something deeply offensive about that. And so staying in one place uh, did, in fact, uh, have a great advantages. And I've, I've always wanted to put roots down because my father was a clergyman and we traveled from one place to another and I never belonged anywhere. Now we do belong somewhere and we belonged in the same place and all our children have been brought up in that way and they're bringing their children up in that way. But that doesn't mean to say that that security should not be enhanced by the ability to see things and to travel and that is an important part of it. So I, I don't want to have a less diverse uh, opportunity. I want to spread that opportunity to a wider number of people. And to do that, I've got to do it in a way which doesn't cost the earth. So it is both and, and that is what we really have to do. And the, the concern I have all the time is that if you, if you say to people, um, I want you to have a very much more restricted life, because that is the only way in which we can deliver what we um, need to do in order to protect life itself, which is what is what we're trying to do in fighting climate change, then you're not going to take them with you. Praise God, bare bones lost. In the end, people wanted Christmas and they wanted mince pies. And so they, in the end, threw him out, and perfectly rightly too, because it's wrong. What we need to do is to offer people with a great variety of life which our system has, has achieved but to do it in a way which doesn't destroy the world so I come back to why I stand really between the uh, kind of conservative who believes that the free market is just left to deal with it in that way and Natalie's view in which you really should control people's social future I stand between those two and say to myself what the government needs to do is to make the market work and to do that, you have to realize that every, every person who believes in competition believes it for other people. What they want is no competition for themselves. That's true of all businessmen. I'm a businessman and I think that too. I'd love to have no competition. I'd be able to put my prices up. If you've got competition, it's extremely good, but it needs to be enforced. And you need also to have it within a context in which you pay the proper price for what you buy. The real problem with our economy is that we don't pay the price. We leave society to pick up the cost of people dropping bottles of um, uh, uh, plastic around. We leave society to pick up the price of pollution. And it's just like those old slag heaps, which the Victorians built. They left the slag heaps for another generation to deal with. What we have to do is to internalize those costs, make it impossible to sell something except at the price it really costs. And then you begin to get a situation in which the market works for society and not dumps its excess on society. And that's why we really have to have a radical conservative government which believes in the market, but doesn't leave it to the people they know perfectly well will want to try to concentrate power and the like. Mr. Trump was not a free enterprise president. He was a believer in occupancy the people who are running the society at this moment. Conservatives ought to believe in disruption, the disruption of the capitalist system, which enters all the time new businesses with new ideas, but within the context which is laid down by the democratically elected government. That's the balance we are. That's what, the, that's what you are as, uh, as bright uh, blue. And insofar as I have political views, that's the major one. It's the only way. It's always both and. It's very <laughs> rarely either one. I see Natalie nodding, so that's a, a lovely way to end. I'm going to ask you one more thing, which is whether you've converted to plant burgers. Well, I, again, I'm, I'm a believer in, I'm a carnivore. I believe that human beings' bodies are made to, to eat the whole range of things, but I eat less meat. Um, I believe that we all ought to eat 20% less meat. We all probably ought to eat 20% less anything, as a matter of fact. Um, but I don't believe the vegan way because I happen to think that a mixed farming is what is necessary. We should have animals. I'd have animals myself, declare an interest. We, we have a, 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 an organic farmer. Um, I produce organic animals and we're just turning the arable to organics. 
Um, because, but you need both. I've got to put my I've got to put my um, cows on 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 the land. That's what I do, and and that's the mixture you have. Uh, what we've all become is very much over. We overeat. We overdo things all the time, and the way to overcome that is to have a society in which we go for better meat, pasture grown meat, and not worse meat but more of it the the Thank meat that overlaps the plate <laughs> unacceptable we're gonna to have to have you and natalie back i think to, to really sort of thrash out some of these issues but we've run out of time but thank you very much indeed all of you for a fascinating discussion um and uh, we'll see what the budget um how it answers some of these some of these questions thank you very much indeed on behalf of bright blue Bye. Bye. Bye.